kind of start to finish. All right. Understanding the purpose of the bread miracles. Understanding the purpose of the bread miracles. Once you found your place in Mark chapter number 8, would you stand for the reading of God's word? Mark 8. Join me. Follow along, please, as we read verses 1 through 9. And in those days, the multitude being very great and having nothing to eat, Jesus called his disciples unto him and saith unto them, I have compassion on the multitude because they have now been with me three days having nothing to eat. And if I send them away fasting to their own houses, they will faint by way for the various or divers of them came from afar. And his disciples answered, From whence can a man satisfy these men with bread here in the wilderness? And he asked them, How many loaves have you? And they said, Seven. And he commanded the people to sit down on the ground, took the seven loaves, gave thanks, break, and gave it to his disciples and set them before. And they did set them before the people. They had a few small fishes, and he blessed and commanded them to sit them also before them. So they did eat and were filled, and they had took up the broken meat. There were left seven baskets. And then they had eaten were about four thousand and he sent them away let's pray father thank you for your word thank you for the truth that it contains help us to get the most out of the text this morning in jesus name amen so where are we pastor well let's let's do a general orientation to make sure we know where we're at in the life of christ and geographically Sea, uh, Mediterranean Sea is over here. This is the Mediterranean Sea, top left over here. Jerusalem would be down here. Here's the Jordan River that Christ was baptized in. There's Canaan, the first miracle wedding feast. Um, Capernaum is the main base or the place where he's probably spent most of his adult ministry. Sea of Galilee. The text, Mark 7.31, says he's on the coast or the border. That's what I've represented in the red line for you. The border of Decapolis, which is this area of ten cities. So we uh, understand he's in this wilderness region right here. This is where the miracle takes place. In those days, the multitude being very great and having nothing to eat, Jesus called his disciples and said unto them, I have compassion on the multitude. Compassion is something that Jesus portrays over and over and over again. It's a regular part of who he is. Seeing people, he's often moved with compassion. Often moved with compassion. I'm afraid in my life, I'm often moved not to be compassionate. I find myself getting hardened. I find myself seeing people and I'll say something like, can't they get a job? Shouldn't they go to work? What do they need that for? I find myself being hardened. Is this a good thing? Not at all. No. But the very world we live in, live in teaches us, encourages us to become hard. We can talk. Yeah, it's a Baptist church. We're going to interact. <laughs> Previously, Christ said in Mark 6, 34, in the feeding of the 5,000, and Jesus, when he came out, saw much people and was moved with them. He had compassion toward them because they were sheep not having a shepherd. Compassion should be a regular part of who we are. We should see people and be moved. We should see struggles and difficulties and be moved to take action. It is a blight on society when people can walk by someone in need of help and do nothing. That is a blight. There's a problem with our society when we see someone who has a need and we who have the ability to help do nothing to help. Not Jesus. Jesus is moved with compassion. He says, and if I send them away fasting to their own house, they will faint by the way, for many of them are from afar off. They've come a long way. They won't be able to get back. They'll, they'll stop.
starve. They will not have the energy. There is no Chick-fil-A drive through to stop by on the way home. We can't imagine this world right here that they're living in. It's beyond our comprehension. So now look at verse 4 in your own Bible because we've got a pretty tough question to deal with right off the bat. Look at verse 4. Yes, look down on your own Bible. That's that thing you carry to church with you on Sundays. It's got a cover on it. It looks like this. It's not this. This is your iPhone. This is your Bible. This is what you carry when you're a Christian to church. This is what everyone carries. This is for followers of Jesus. This is for anyone. Did I make my point? If you don't have a Bible, buy one. If you have one, carry it. So look at verse 4. Visitor, if you don't have a Bible, please come back next week. <laughs> and his disciples answered, From whence can a man satisfy these men with bread here in the wilderness? From whence? From where? From where can a man satisfy these men with bread here in the wilderness? Now why is that a difficult question? Why am I struggling with that? Someone tell me please, why are we pausing and going, why are they asking this question? Why? Because they already saw it. What did they see already? They saw 5,000, Meredith. They saw 5,000. Hello? Um, men? It was just a little while ago that we were in the same dilemma and did I not pull out quite a miracle there? Why are you asking where are we going to get bread from in this wilderness if in fact you saw me already feed 5,000? Now I want to say I'm just like the disciples. Let's talk about that. How many of you have had God answer a prayer for you in a very specific and unique way and you knew that it was an answer prayer? Raise your hand to give testimony to God. So nearly everyone in here has had some prayer answered for your life in some way. So if God has done it one time for you, and he has like this, then why do we as frail human beings often go when we're on our second or third or fourth or fifth or sixth time going, Hello Lord, can you do this? How much are we just like these disciples? How much are we just like these disciples struggling from day to day to day to have faith? Waning in our faith? How much? How much are we just like these disciples? I would submit to you probably a lot. Probably a lot like these disciples. Now this question has, this question that the disciples asked have caused some people to suggest, especially liberal scholars, that there was only one miracle and that the numbers are just confusing and really what we have is a doublet. That he only did it one time and that we have a record of the same miracle with slightly different variants. So let's talk about that. Here's the chart. 5,000 versus 4,000 at Bethsaida near Decapolis, set on grass, described as a wilderness. Jesus wanted rest, no mention of rest. There's a storm mentioned, there's no mention of a storm. The multitude is from nearby, the multitude is far off. Jesus was with him for one day, Jesus was with him for three days. There were five loaves and two loaves, fish, there were seven loaves and a few fish. There's not enough money in this case, there's no bread to be found in the wilderness. There are 12 hand baskets worth. There are seven full baskets. This miracle is found in all four Gospels. This miracle is found only in Matthew and Mark. So folks, do we have two miracles or one miracle? We have clearly two miracles. There's way too many details that are strikingly different to decide that it's one miracle. Agree or disagree? All right, let's go on. Look down at Mark 8, 17 through 21. After the 4,000 miracle, I want you to read with me in verse 17. And when Jesus knew it, he said unto them, Why reason you because you have no bread? Perceive you yet? Perceive you not yet? Neither understand? That's really a kind way of saying, how stupid are you? Okay, let's continue. Perceive you not yet? neither understand have your heart yet hardened having eyes see you not 
Having ears, hear you not? Do you not remember? Now let's see what he says about remember. Let's look very closely. Do you not remember when I break five loaves among how many? Five thousand. How many baskets full of fragments you took up? And they said twelve. And then he said, and when the seven among what? Four thousand. How many baskets full of fragments took you up? Verse 21. How is it that you do not understand? So did Jesus uh, ascribe one miracle or two miracles? Beyond a doubt, two miracles. 5,000 and 4,000. You know, it's amazing to me, please listen. It's amazing to me how the liberal scholars just can't simply interpret the Word of God plainly. Just, just take it at face value. It's not rocket scientists. 5,000, 4,000. You've got two choices here. Either Jesus is a liar or there were two miracles. It's real simple. Mark's probable motive for arranging his material in this manner was to show how dull the disciples are. They don't get it right away. They struggle just like you and I struggle. They're human beings just like you and I struggle. And so he, he repeats the teaching and repeats the miracles before they could understand it. Let me show you how cleverly well it's organized. Mark makes reference to feeding the multitude in 6, 31 through 44. Makes reference to crossing a lake. Makes reference to dispute with the disciples. Makes reference to discussion about bread. A healing miracle occurs. There's a confession of faith. And then he does it all over again in the exact same order. Only this time it's 4,000 crossing a lake again. Another dispute with Pharisees. Another discussion about bread. Another miracle. And then another confession of faith. What's the point? Repetition is the glue to learning. Over and over and over and over and over and over and over again. And Mark says, you probably didn't get it through 6 through 7. So let me just give it to you all over again. And he does the exact same thing almost verbatim, teaching us, reinforcing us. Verse 5. So he says, how many loaves have you? Now did Jesus not know how many loaves there were? Did he know? Yes or no, church? Talk to me. So then why in the world does he take the time to ask the question, how many loaves do you have? He's not going to ask something just for the point of not knowing it. He knows. So why does he ask? For them. And us today. To reinforce beyond a shadow of doubt that seven loaves is not enough for 4,000 people. You let me have seven loaves to feed this crowd and you guys are going to be whining shortly thereafter. Who planned this event? <laughs> right? Sure. Can't imagine how many loaves it would take to feed this crowd. A lot. A lot. Because remember, loaves and fish, that's about it. They're not eating meatloaf, craving, mashed potatoes, vegetables, dessert, and a big glass of sweet tea. Okay, they don't even know how to eat good. Okay, it hasn't even been invented yet. There's no cracker barrels. So let me remind you, we're not talking about the 5,000 miracle with the little boy. This is not the same miracle. This is the second one. Don't get confused. There's no little boy giving up his lunch in this miracle. It has nothing to do with it. Verse 6. He commanded the people to sit down on the ground and he took the seven loaves and gave thanks. What is the significance of commanding the people to sit down? Why would you do that? Order and a what? Account. You're not going to get a mass of people. Go to a mall and try to count. How do you, how do you get a decent count? You got to do what with the people? You got to organize them. You know how hard it would be to get a count of everyone in this room if there were no pews and y'all were just standing around? You know how hard it would be to get an accurate count? You got to set the people down. Why are we doing all this? We're establishing beyond a shadow of a doubt that there were only seven loaves and there were 4,000 people. We got a good count on the food. We got a good count on the bodies. And we got a count on the leftovers. All the details are present to validate the fact that this is a what? A miracle. They had a few small fishes. A few small fishes. Two. 
two descriptive words to make sure that there's no doubt we don't have enough fish. So let's ask ourselves. He feeds them and he sends them on their way. So let's ask ourselves, what was the point of both these feeding miracles? The 4,000, the 5,000, and the 4,000. What is the point? What should I take away from these miracles? Well, lesson one we saw from the very beginning is that Jesus was moved with compassion. That he was a kind, compassionate people who had a general interest in the physical needs of people. That's the first lesson. That's the face value right up the front lesson that we walk away with. Our master gives us an example of being kind, compassionate person who has a general interest in the physical needs of people. It's precisely why we have a food pantry. It's precisely why we take up collections. It's precisely why we give away food. We don't want people starving. It is a blight on the Christian church when they're in a community and they do nothing to help with the food problem in a city. That's a blight. That is a reproach on a church. Okay? Now, let's go beyond that. Let's never forget this morning and forever in our lives that the best commentary on the Word of God is the Word of God. That's the best commentary. When you're seeking to understand a scripture, start with other scriptures surrounding it. If you have a good study Bible, it should have maybe a cross reference, for example. And that will lead you to other scriptures. In our case, when we're looking at the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, we want to always look, is there another example of this miracle in another Gospel? We call them synoptic because they come together to tell an entire story. So let's look over to John chapter 6. And let's camp out at John 6 for the rest of the time we're gathered this morning, understanding the purpose of the bread miracles. John 6. Let's begin by looking at the structure of John 6. The organization of John 6. My Bible has some bold printed that says five loaves and two fishes. Look down at verse number 5. And when they lifted up their eyes and they saw a great company come unto him, he said unto Philip, Where shall we buy bread that these may eat? So we're dealing with another bread miracle. It's the 5,000. Look at verse number 10. Make the men sit down. We've got to get an accurate count. Verse number 11. And Jesus took the loaves and when he had given thanks, he distributed them to the disciples. The disciples to them that were set down and likewise the fish as much as they would eat. Or they would. Verse 12. When they filled, he said unto the disciples, Gather you up the fragments that remain, that nothing be lost. Alright, so we're looking at the context of John 6, and we've got the feeding of the what? Of the 5,000. Okay? So a bread miracle. Now, look at your Bible in verse 14. After this amazing miracle, look how the men respond. Then those men, when they had seen the miracle that Jesus did say, look what they said, this is of a truth, that prophet that should come into the world. This has got to be him. This has got to be him. We have been waiting for a prophet. We know that there was a promise in the Old Testament. It's found in Deuteronomy 18.18. 18. God, Yahweh, told Moses, I'm going to send you a prophet. Let's look at it together on the screen. I, Yahweh, will raise them up a prophet from among their brethren. That means he's going to be a Jew. Like unto thee, Moses, and will put my words in his mouth, and he shall speak unto them all that I shall command them. So they knew that they had a promise from God that God was going to send them a what? Okay, next time everyone's going to say it. That'll be my way of knowing sure that you're connecting. Prophets. So they say, thank you. They say, this is him. This is him. Why did they make the connection? Why did they make the connection? What miracle did they see that caused them? What did they remember about Moses? What is the connection? Someone tell me. The manna. That's exactly right. The manna. 
In verses 15 through 21, Jesus crosses the lake, walks right across the lake. I sent this to Pastor Bill last night. Joey was doing some research. And I found out from the University of Florida. Anybody down from the University of Florida? Anybody? Okay, very good, Mike. You will appreciate this. That they have decided that Jesus did not walk on the water. Instead, he stood on an ice block and floated across. So I am thrilled, Gary, that our taxpaying dollars are going to those kind of studies from those people in those universities for us to discover how he got across. He actually stepped from the shore onto an ice block, stood on the ice block, and then it floated across. It's ridiculous. It's absurd. Okay? But when you're an unbeliever, you've got to do everything you can to discredit the Word of God. What's in the balance? Hell. Hell's in the balance. 22. The day following, when the people which stood on the other side of the sea saw that there was none on the boat there, except the one wherein the disciples were entered, that Jesus went not with the disciples into the boat, but the disciples were gone away alone. Alright, so, hey, there was only one boat. The disciples got in the boat. Jesus didn't get in that boat. The disciples are gone. Jesus is gone. Oh, something. They were expecting Jesus to be on this side and the disciples on that side. Because there was only one boat... You're not going to swim across the Sea of Galilee. Jesus left behind. They went. Jesus stayed. Jesus is gone. When the people therefore saw that Jesus was not there, neither his disciples, they took the shipping to Capernaum. Shipping means they're going to get in the boats and they're going to follow along. Verse 25. When they found him on the other side, they said, Rabbi, how'd you get here? Disciples went on a boat. We went on a boat. There's no helicopters in those days. How'd you get here? Pretty puzzled, aren't they? 26. Jesus says, Truly, truly, I say unto you, you seek me not because you saw the miracles, but because you did eat of the loaves. Let's just stop right here. Let's just camp out right here. Why are you in church? Why are you in church? Why are you here this morning? Are you here this morning because you can get a lot of good connections with your small group? You know, for your business? Let's look. Let's look. What does it say? Verily, verily, I say unto you, you seek me not because you saw the miracles, but because you did eat the loaves. Why'd they follow him across the way? Why'd they follow him across the way? Why'd they get in boats and follow him along the way? Because he fed them. You think an entitlement mentality society is new? They've been looking for a free lunch for 2,000 years. He provides a free lunch. He provides bread. They don't have to work hard for this bread. This is great. You don't have to plant it. You don't have to weed it. You don't have to water it. You don't have to harvest it. You don't have to grind it. You don't have to bake it. You just follow Jesus around. I mean, this is a good gig. He teaches. We're entertained. And when we all get hungry, he spreads out more bread. We eat and we keep following him around. Do you not see that in the text? Am I adding something that's not there? But because you did eat the loaves. You're not in church because Jesus is your all. You're not here because you're crazy about the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. You're here because your wife makes you come. Because your mom and dad make you come. You can't wait to turn 18 and get rid of this. Hello? It says very clearly. But because you did eat the loaves. How many people get up every morning, uh, every Sunday and go to church somewhere and they're going to that church because of what they hear as it tickles their ears and encourages them that God is going to make them wealthy? You think the prosperity gospel is a new thing? It's not a new thing. The prosperity gospel is right there. They were looking for free loaves. He says very clearly, you're not following me because you saw the miracles. You're following me because I put food in your belly. No food, no Jesus. So then he says in verse 27, you talk about getting pointed to us in our face. He says, labor not for the meat which perishes. How many Christians... 
their number one objective in life is to make money. How many Christians live to make money? How many of you young people, the decision you're making with regard to what occupation you're going to pursue is predicated upon how much money you can make? How many would say, I'm going to the medical field and I don't care if I don't make a penny. I'm there to serve people. How many say, I'm going to be a lawyer and I'm going to work for a defense fund. I'm going to be a missionary. I'll barely make any money at all. I'm going to use my law skills to promote Christian values and freedom and faith and those kind of things. I am not interested in going to law school to make all kinds of money. How many are refusing to consider the mission field because you know missionaries don't make make a lot of money. He says very clearly, labor not for the food which perishes. Let's stop for just a moment and let's consider something as a church. Please wake up. Please think about this. How many of us have large sums of money tied up in 401k plans and all you have to show your ownership of it is a piece of paper? So, and if the economy was to collapse, the money you have could be just like this, gone. Gone. If you study the book of Revelation, you will see that there is a time where it is going to take a large sum of money to buy a loaf of bread. We have far too many people relying upon a faith in a trust fund or a 401k plan or something like that. Let's understand something, folks. That whole thing is predicated upon trust. And you let the economy go bananas or upside down. What are you going to do? Take your 401k statement to where? To the mutual fund manager? Who's in the same boat you're in? You say, are you trying to scare us this morning? No, I'm not trying to scare you. I'm trying to remind you, labor not for meat which perishes. How much labor should we do sufficient to provide for the needs of your family? That's all. You're not going to take it with you. I said, you're not going to take it with you. You let the economy go upside down in America and see what, how much money you really have in the bank. Because remember, it's not in the bank, folks. It's just a number. Your cash is not in that bank. Your cash has gone out of there. There's no envelope with your name on it in that bank. That's exactly what he means when he says, labor not for the food which perishes. But instead, instead, what should I focus on? You focus on the food which endures unto everlasting life. And that's what you focus on. You focus on that which brings within you true focus. True future focus. You focus on that which gives you comfort forever. There is a problem in your Christianity when you spend more time reading the money section of USA Today than the Word of God. There is a problem with your Christianity where every single morning you're looking at your 401k plan and every night you go to bed looking at it and you're constantly tracking, 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 tracking. You know what you're doing? You're laboring for food which perishes. Then he says in verse 27b, For him hath God the Father sealed. I've got a seal right for you here. It's a, it's a Roman seal. What the, was the seal all about? Here's the seal right here. Here's the piece of clay. I would take this and I would mash it down into that. What is this all about? What is the seal all about? Someone tell me. What is the seal all about in those days? A guarantee. Very good. What else? Authority. What else? Ownership. Very good. How do I know where the message actually came from the emperor? Is his seal on it? 
There's only one seal and it's his seal. Can't replicate it. It's got certain marks, custom design right there, unique only to him. And when I put my seal on it, you know it came from me. So what is this verse now saying? With that understanding, look at the text again. For him hath God the Father sealed. Who has received God's stamp of approval? Jesus, the Son of Man has. So they respond after hearing this. Look at this. Look at this on the text. Look, look. What shall we do then that we might work these works? Okay. Um, <laughs> were you not listening? I'm not giving a seminar on how to make seven loaves feed 4,000 people. How many people are following Christianity for what God can do for them? He says in response, this is the work of God. You want to know the work of God? How can we do the work of God? This is the work of God, that you believe on him who hath he sent. What do we mean by believe? I've got some uh, alternate words up there, some synonyms for you. Have faith in, lean in, trust on, depend on, rely upon. Struggling with your life? Trust in Jesus. Struggling with your life? Rely on Jesus. Struggling with the economy? Lean on Jesus. Struggling with whether we're going to 15 trillion dollar debt and we're going to go upside down? Lean on Jesus. Struggling on whether the closing down of the military means you're going to lose your job as they get rid of 100,000 soldiers? Lean on Jesus. Trust in Jesus. Rely on Jesus. Have faith in Jesus. Not the next president or the current president. Who? Jesus. What's God's work for your life? What's God's work for my life? Have faith in Jesus. Lean on Jesus. Trust in Jesus. Praise Jesus. Be bananas for Jesus. So they respond. Look at this. This is amazing. Almost like us. Verse 30. They said therefore unto him, What signs showest thou then, or that we may see or believe thee, the work that thou doest? Hello? Let, let's see, let's see, let's see what sign you need. The day before I fed 5,000 people, I got to the other side of the Sea of Galilee without a boat, I didn't swim, I'm not exhausted, and you're asking for a new sign? How many signs do you need? In another case, they'll tell us that it's only the sign you're going to get is the sign of the resurrection, that's it. We'll get to that. So they respond with, our, father did eat man our fathers did eat manna in the desert as it is written. He gave them bread from heaven to eat. You remember that when they're in the wilderness and they get manna dumped on them? Look at how Jesus cuts to the case. And Jesus said unto them, truly, truly, I say unto you, Moses gave you not that bread from heaven. Don't you give Moses credit for that miracle? Moses doesn't give the, get the glory for that miracle. He says, our father, my father. Now that's, that's, that's blasphemous words to them. You can call him our father, but to call him my father implies that he's not our father. That you have a unique and special relationship with him that we don't have. And you don't have the right to say that. Moreover, he says... Moses gave not you that bread from heaven, but my Father gives you the true bread from heaven. Let's stop talking about physical loaves, can we? And change the topic of the true bread. Here's the point. I'll try to graphically illustrate for you. Yahweh sent Moses, but it's not about Moses anymore. Yahweh sent Jesus, and it's all about Jesus. It's all about Jesus. Moses to Jesus, Yahweh to Jesus. The focus of this miracle is to prove He is the one. That's the point. So he says, For the bread of God is He which comes down from heaven and gives life unto the world. That's Jesus. He is the bread of God. You are to nourish yourself on Jesus. So let's be clear. Eating the manna in the desert did not result in eternal life. Agreed or disagreed? All right? Moreover, go back, Art, please. I clicked it too much. 
Likewise, not all the 5,000 or all the 4,000 that ate bread from Jesus will be in heaven. Agreed or disagreed? Likewise, not everyone assembled here this morning will be in heaven. Somebody on this road could die and go to hell. Somebody on this road could die and go to hell. Somebody over in this section may die and go to hell. But you say, wait a minute, I was here. Hey, they ate food. They hung out with Jesus. Look how dull they are. Lord, evermore give us this bread. What, what, what are you kidding? We're not talking about physical bread. We've left that discussion a long time ago. This has nothing to do with physical bread anymore. I told you not to labor for that which perishes. Physical bread perishes. Manna perished. 1 Corinthians 1.18 says, For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved it is the power of God. That's precisely why, Jonathan, when you're up there leading in worship and you look around, you can see people going just like this. And they are not moved in any way, shape, or form by the lyrics of the worship that we are singing to the only begotten Son of God. Not at all. Nothing moves them standing still, looking at their watch, wondering when are we going to get done. I am the bread of life. He that comes to me shall never hunger, and he that believes on me shall never thirst. So let me ask you this morning, you know your Bible to some degree, you know early church history. Did the apostles hunger and thirst after this in a physical sense, yes or no? Yes, you better believe they did. They were beaten, they were whooped, they were um, imprisoned. Was Paul cold, tired, wet, hungry many times? Yes. So he's not talking about physical food. He's not talking about physical thirst. What then is he talking about this morning, church? Spiritual things. I said unto you that you also have seen me and believe not. All that the Father gives to me shall come to me. And him that comes to me I will in no wise cast out. For I came down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of the Father that sent me. And this is the Father's will which he hath sent me, that of all which he hath given me, I should lose nothing. This is precisely why we are not free will Baptists. Because we believe that he said, I'll lose nothing. And if you are his, he has promised, you cannot be lost. You can't lose yourself. He said, I should lose nothing. But what? What am I going to do? Notice it very clearly. Raise it up again on the last day. God has promised that although you may get hungry and you may get thirsty and you may die of cancer, He promises He will raise you up on the last day. You will not spend forever in a grave. There is coming a day when the dead in Christ shall hear His voice. And if you think feeding 5,000 with seven loaves of the bread, you wait until you see the molecular restructuring of human bodies from the sea. That'll be a miracle. Four people got it this morning. Four people. There are many people that have died on the battlefields in Europe and we don't know where they're at. There are many people that died in Vietnam and we don't know where they're at. There are many people that died on ships and we don't know where they're at. There are bodies on that most recent cruise that may not get recovered. God forbid that they don't, but there's a possibility there's a body that doesn't get recovered. God knows where that body is. And if that person is a believer, he has promised that on the last day, he will unite their soul with that body. I will lose nothing. I'm going to raise it up again at the last day. There is coming a day in the future where God will come again. And when he comes again, the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which alive will meet.
meet him in the air. And together we will be with him forever in glory. And let me promise you right now, in glory, you will not have to worry about an economy or a $15 trillion debt. Or whether you're going to lose your job, or whether your child's going to premature birth, or anything, or anything, or anything, or anything. So labor not for the things that perish. Stop working so hard on that which has no eternal value. Forget about it. Focus on that which has eternal value. And the only thing that has eternal value on this earth are people. Souls. Everything else is going to get burned up. Everything else is going to get burned up. Everything else is going to get burned up. Every building, every pew, every piece of carpet, every cross, every single thing is going to get burnt up. Nothing's going to survive the creation of a new heaven and a new earth. Nothing. Only the souls of the redeemed make it through to the other side. And this is the will of of him that sent me that everyone which sees the Son and believes on him may have everlasting life and I will raise him up at the last day it doesn't get any better than that that is an unconditional promise from the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords that if you see Jesus this morning, put your faith in Him. Put your faith in Jesus this morning. Put your faith in Jesus this morning. Trust in Christ this morning. Trust in Christ with your heart, mind, soul, body, and every bit of your being. Trust in Christ with your fingernails. Trust in Christ with every part of who you are. The entire metaphor of being the bread of God is built on the idea that He is my all-sustaining it. I don't need anything else. I can be happy when my football team loses the game because He is my all-consuming everything. When you get up in the morning and you're anxious, trust in Christ. When you go to bed at night and you're anxious, trust in Christ. When you read Fox News, trust in Christ. When you watch Fox News, trust in Christ. When you're on any of the other networks, trust in Christ. Trust in Christ. Trust in Christ. Trust in Christ. One of the reasons why some of you are struggling so much of this is because you listen to garbage music. And so your garbage music does not encourage you to trust in Christ, lean on Christ, have faith in Christ. You allow yourself to watch television shows that are not gospel-centered, Christ-exalting shows. And so you're filling your mind with garbage. Yes or no? And that's why he's not at all for us. Because we're taking in so much other stuff. He's wheat bread and we're eating rye and we're eating white. He, it's it. He's all. Nothing else. He's my all sufficiency. That's the idea in the text. All right, let's pray.